hearing somebody burp. Good evening and welcome to Chicago tonight on this Tuesday, February 12th. The solution requires a collective commitment to embracing hard choices. What's in store for the Illinois budget? Meet two top members of the new Pritzker administration. Blackface then and now. We unpack the controversy and its racist baggage. There are more than 100,000 women suing manufacturers over painful complications from vaginal mesh. What is it and why are doctors battling over its safety? A new exhibition looks at the domestic slave trade in America in the early 19th century. And of mice and men in space, Chicago researchers team with NASA to study the impact of prolonged space flight in the hopes of paving the way to a future Mars colony. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brandis Friedman. A scary bridge situation is fixed for the time being. Paris Schutz has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Paris. Brandis, northbound Lakeshore Drive is back open this evening after being shut down near Randolph over the last 24 plus hours. It snarled last evening's commute. City officials put a temporary fix in place to hold up a damaged bridge there, and they have more answers today about what exactly caused the problem. But questions remain about how up to date the rest of the city's bridges are, especially in light of the recent extreme weather. Two temporary support towers are holding up this bridge and the 60,000 vehicles that travel across it each day. This after two out of seven steel girders that support the bridge cracked yesterday. More specifically, the steel contracts and expands due to changes in temperature, but joints that keep those girders in place were corroded. In this case, uh, we think that the extreme cold created such contraction that it pushed uh, some more minor corrosion into a more extreme situation. Chicago Department of Transportation officials say the towers will be in place for the next couple of weeks while the city waits for replacement parts to arrive. It will allow us to make repairs to the original structure there to reinforce it to handle the necessary load. City officials also put up a temporary structure just south of the cracked bridge out of precaution. They say there are only a few other bridges in the city with this specific design that faces the same risks. Dr. P.S. Suraj, Director of Urban Transportation at the University of Illinois at Chicago, says more than 8% of bridges in Illinois are structurally deficient. That translates to about 2,400 bridges, most of which are in Chicago. That's a really alarming number. It's a high number, considering that we have the third highest num number of bridges in the country. Mayor Emanuel used the occasion again to urge state lawmakers to fund a major capital bill that would repair roads, bridges, and public transit by hiking the state's gas tax. He says Illinois is falling woefully behind. 24 states have done it. A lot of states in the Midwest in the last four years because they can't rely on Washington and they know it's essential for the health and well-being of the economy. Swaraj says the state has planned to spend $2.6 billion on bridge maintenance over the next six years, but the total cost to bring all bridges into compliance is closer to $10 billion. Swaraj says the state is playing Russian roulette with bridge safety and must act with urgency to avoid the worst case scenario, a bridge failure. Not all of them translate into a tragedy, but there's a very high probability that they may end up in a disaster. The construction company FH Passion assisted the city in stabilizing the Lakeshore Drive Bridge. Mayor Emanuel is once again taking aim at e-cigarette companies. Emanuel announced the city is suing 27 online retailers of e-cigarettes and four retail stores for selling vapes to minors. A city ordinance raised the tobacco purchasing age to 21 years old. Emanuel and city officials accused the vape retailers of deceptive marketing. The city filed a similar suit back in November. We as a city 
are going to continue to be vigilant in trying to prevent the tobacco companies from doing what they're doing to our children and use all the resources to help our parents in protecting kids from these unhealthy and very dangerous and life-threatening products. And there's more on this story on our website. As for the weather, snow tonight with less than half an inch of accumulation and breezy with a low around 18. Plus, a wind advisory is in effect until 3 a.m. Then tomorrow, partly sunny and a breezy high of near 28 degrees. And you never have to miss Chicago tonight. You can stream on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also watch via podcast and the PBS video app. Now, Brandis, back to you. Paris, thank you. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker is beginning to implement priorities like increasing the minimum wage. And some of his other priorities are being revealed in recently released transition reports. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Finicky is here with more. And Amanda, we talked about these reports just last week. They're here now. What do they say? Well, Brandis, there are actually 11 of these reports, and they cover a lot of ground, everything from agriculture to veterans affairs. These are written by experts that Governor Pritzker chose to give recommendations. He called them, I believe, guideposts posts for his administration. There's no rule that Pritzker has to follow these recommendations. You're seeing video actually from when he first announced the first of these transition committees back in November. While he did pick some Republicans to serve on them and a broad cross section of individuals overall, the reports, no surprise, align with what he has pledged to do all along. So what's an example? Well, let's look at a report that focuses on the economy and jobs. It says the state needs to improve its reputation for being beneficial to businesses. Under the previous Republican governor, Bruce Rauner, the way to do that was to curb manufacturers worker, workers' compensation costs. That's something you still hear a lot about actually from Illinois' major business organizations. The Pritzker report doesn't make any mention of workers' compensation. So what does the report recommend instead? Well, the transition team's answer to Illinois' lagging job growth includes investing in programs like parental and family leave, increased financial aid for higher education, expanding training programs for youth, for minorities, and creating a new entity that is focused on regional business growth. Also, it says that to move Illinois forward toward a more prosperous future and maintain its competitive edge, the state needs to to focus resources and attention on the highest potential sectors, including transportation, advanced manufacturing, financial services. There's mention of creating a biotech center focusing on specialty crop production like industrial hemp, something that actually is already getting underway. So let's switch gears a little bit, Amanda, and talk about infrastructure, obviously something that's been getting a lot of attention uh, after the problems on Lakeshore Drive. The report says the state lacks a sustainable approach to infrastructure investments. While it calls for a sustainable, consistent funding stream, it does not recommend one. It does call for establishing public-private partnerships, and there's a recommendation for someone in state government to act as a sort of infrastructure czar. So earlier this week, Governor Pritzker announced a new initiative that would be headed by his Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton, that'll be focused on criminal justice. What are the recommendations there? Well, here the report calls for a more compassionate approach to criminal justice. For instance, by increasing the thresholds for when retail theft and drugs become felony versus misdemeanor crimes. We know that Pritzker wants to legalize pot. The report says when that happens, Illinois needs to restore the rights of people who are currently behind bars for cannabis convictions. It also calls for more vocational training in prisons, mandated training for prison guards and law enforcement, and more help for prisoners once they are released. Violence, of course, Amanda, that's a huge concern for Chicagoans. Any recommendations on that front? Yes, the recommendation is that Pritzker convene a multi-state task force to talk about guns illegally crossing borders, for example, guns that come into the Chicago area from Indiana. Also, stricter requirements for when a firearm is lost, making it harder to get a fire owner's identification card if someone has a history of animal abuse or domestic violence, and dealing with 3D printed guns. And I can't let you go, Amanda, without bringing up the budget. What's up there? Of course you can't. Well, during his inaugural address, Fritzker got huge applause when he promised to pass a balanced budget and to do it on time. It won't be easy, but let's confront this challenge with honesty. Our obligations as a state outmatch our resources. Our fiscal situation right now is challenging. And the solution requires a collective commitment to embracing hard choices. 
This report does not give a ton of insight into just how he's planning to do that, but we do get some. There's a call for managing spending. Still, that can't be expected to make much of a dent considering Illinois' financial situation. As for revenue, there are recommendations that call for moving to a graduated income tax, like Pritzker campaigned on, as well as new taxes, for example, on e-cigarettes, marijuana, and plastic bags, perhaps. There's also mention of a tax on services that have been traditionally exempt. There's no real proposal, but behind, per, real proposal that is behind that. These reports do keep it pretty general. A key takeaway, though, is just how different things are from the Rauner era. For example, the reports have a lot of emphasis on using union labor and also making sure that undocumented immigrants can access government services. Amanda, thank you. And now to Paris with two top members of the Pritzker administration, Paris. And Brandis, we're going to try and lock them down on some of those specifics. As you know, next week, Governor J.B. Pritzker will deliver his first ever and much anticipated budget address. His administration just released a report on the perilous state of Illinois finances that you just heard a lot about. It lays much of the blame on Bruce Rauner's, quote, ideological warfare, saying, quote, Illinois already had fiscal challenges to overcome, but the previous administration drove the state into a dip. So how does this administration plan to get out of that ditch? Joining us are one of Pritzker's top lieutenants who headed up the review, Deputy Governor Dan Hines. He was also the Illinois controller from 1999 to 2011. And another of Pritzker's leaders on state finances, Illinois Department of Revenue Director David Harris. He is a Republican who served as a state representative for a total of 18 years. Gentlemen, welcome both of you back to Chicago tonight. So first, let's lay out the challenges that your administration is facing. First, $3.2 billion budget deficit for the coming year. $15 billion in unpaid bills, $2 billion in additional bond interest payments, $1.25 billion in late payment interest penalties. That's a lot. You've both been around state government for a long time. You've both been involved in perilous fiscal situations. How does this current situation compare to those? Well, it's no secret that these problems have been mounting for years, but the budget impasse under Governor Rauner made the problem escalate to you know, unparalleled levels. As you mentioned, $15 billion in unpaid bills and debt, a $3.2 billion budget deficit. So we were making progress in Illinois, uh, Governor Rauner, because he was uh, just adamant about passing uh, legislation that really had nothing to do with the budget, brought our state to a halt and caused this, uh, these problems to escalate. So we are now, after making this assessment and realizing just how severe the damage is, coming up with a budget proposal for the governor next week, and he'll address this head on. And, and David Harris, simply put, how does the governor plan to close that $3.2 billion gap? Well, first of all, there's no magic bullet. There's no magic wand or silver bullet that's, uh, that's going to solve it, or even a change of administration that's going to solve it overnight. Uh, but I think the governor has taken a realistic approach, as he has said, a realistic approach to put numbers on paper that match, that the revenues and the spending come together. Um, in terms of exactly how he's going to do it, you're going to have to wait and see uh, next Wednesday. But uh, that is his goal, and I think he's going to meet it. Well, some of the revenues that you've talked about, uh, vaping tax, how would that work and how much money could that bring in? Well, first let me say that, it's, it's, as David said, this is not going to be solved in one year. The, the ultimate solution is a graduated income tax. But for the fiscal year 2020 budget, it's going to be a combination of controlled, disciplined spending, and then real revenues that are uh, both realistic and immediate. So uh, e-cigarette taxes, expanding gambling into sports betting, uh, legalizing marijuana and taxing that. These are ways that we can tax uh, and, and bring in revenue uh, without hurting middle class taxes. Do you have a realistic figure uh, in terms of how much those things could bring in in revenue in 2020? Well, it's those and, and several other ideas. And I, and I would say that when you're tackling a $3.2 billion deficit. You're not going to do it with all revenues. You're certainly not going to be able to cut your way out of it. It's going to take a combined, balanced approach. So we will probably find new revenues uh, matched with some spending controls um, and looking at a way to really come to terms with a pension system that is, tr that is suffocating our state, that is causing severe pressure on how we balance our budget. Is there a number assigned to e-cigarette? Tax. And how uh, much would yeah, that tax be? Yeah, I mean, we're looking at, I think, a, a, a tax somewhere to put it on par with some of the, um, you know, other non-cigarette items that are out there. Uh, other states have done this already. Um, we're still working on the estimates to that, but, you know, it, it'll be a combined revenue picture 
that helps us balance the budget in an honest and realistic way. David Harris, cannabis legalization, how much could that bring in? I don't even want to venture a guess. Uh, because a lot of it determines on what the legislature says, this is how we're going to handle the, uh, the legalization of, uh, of um, recreational cannabis. Um, uh, you have to, there's a tipping point, you have to be careful, there's a tipping point between how much tax is levied and, uh, and whether or not you are fomenting a black market. If, it, if the tax is too high, then it's, it's more profitable to enter into a black market. So um, I don't think anything has been set yet other than moving in the direction, as, as the governor has said, uh, favoring uh, recreational cannabis. So when we hear the governor's budget address, are we, are we going to hear specific amounts th uh, uh, that we can expect from these taxes, or, or is he going to talk about needing to hear what the legislature plans on these things first? Well, I'll defer to Dan in terms of specifics on what the governor's going to yeah, say. Yeah, I mean, we're getting close to a presentation being finalized, and, and there will definitely be specifics. This is going to be a budget that is very transparent, and very honest and open, um, as the governor has been throughout uh, not only the campaign but the transition. Uh, he's been open about the fact that the graduate income tax is the key to our future. He's been open about the fact that the immediate uh, budget problem is not going to go away on itself or with cuts. It's going to require some revenues. And so we'll be very specific and exact uh, and transparent about the revenue picture. How about revenue from increased gaming? Is that something the governor is banking on in 2020? I don't know if the governor is banking on it. Uh, I know that the legislature has, uh, legislators have proposed an increase in gaming, both, uh, both uh, casino gaming as well as video display terminals. Um, that conceivably could bring in uh, uh, additional revenue, yes. And uh, uh, um, selling the Thompson Center, is that something that's going to be on the table again? You know, I, I'm glad you asked that. So <laughs> this, is a, uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a gimmick that has been used many years by previous administrations, not only, you know, creating a false sense of getting that done, uh, but also balancing the budget on something that wasn't going to happen. Uh, we are committed to selling the Thompson Center because the building is dilapidated, and I think there's a better use for that asset. But we are not going to balance the budget with those projected revenues. If we are able to sell that Thompson Center, we will use that to shore up pensions and pay down the backlog. We will not be balancing the budget or using for operational revenues. So one of the other things we mentioned at the top was this $15 billion backlog that you've calculated. I think the Rauner administration had pinned it at about $8 billion. Can the state start to make a dent in that and balance uh, the $3.2 billion budget gap and fund all the priorities it needs to fund? Again, you're going to have to. The governor is going to present a realistic budget. Can we cut down on the back debt? Yes, we can cut down on the back debt. It's not going to be easy. But let me tell you, during that impasse, we were in, uh, we were uh, uh, having two million dollars a day in just in interest charges. We've got to get that under control. The governor's pledged to do that. We're going to cut down on that debt and make it uh, make it uh, practical for uh, for us to do it. All right. Part of this budget, nine billion dollar mandatory payment into the state's beleaguered pension systems just to keep them afloat. Will the state make that full payment? Well, I think in your er earlier question, you talk about a, the balance. Um, we are going to have to come up with some immediate revenues. We're going to have to hold the line on spending, but we do have to come to terms with this crushing pension debt that has bedeviled the state for many years. Uh, this Earlier in the week, we announced two different task forces that are going to look into ways to stabilize our pension system. Number one, consolidating the over 600 pension systems across the state. Unbelievably inefficient. Our, we have some systems that are so small that they can't have a broad uh, a portfolio of investments. We can't negotiate low fees. So consolidation is part of it. Finding assets that could be monetized and moved into the pension system to shore up the pension system, system is important. But yes, we need to look at the funding schedule that was put in place 25 years ago that at the time thought we would be spending about $4 billion on pensions, and now it's asking us to put $9 billion in. That is 20% of our revenues, and I don't think the designers of that plan ever envisioned the state of Illinois putting 20% of its revenues into the pension system. So we need to look, take a hard look at that. And does this have the, uh, the possibility of crowding out spending for other priorities like higher education and K through 12 education? Does it have the possibility? Certainly it does. I mean, if, 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 uh, if $9 billion is required for just pensions, if indeed that's what uh, is determined, then that's going to crowd out spending elsewhere. But the question is, how do you, uh, how do you put the, the pension problem in a more realistic uh, format that it can be addressed without having to 
put all that money in. And, and Mr. Hines mentioned putting assets that the state owns into those funds. What kind of assets are we talking about? Are there any off the, uh, off the top of your head that you can think of right away? Well, there's an, I think there's a number of them that uh, may have been looked at. Um, again, I don't, know what, I don't want to put out the specifics of what has been talked about, but um, uh, there are a number of assets that can... Uh, the pensions are, pensions are always nothing more than a, a, a numbers problem. How much goes in, how much goes out, what, what are the accrued benefits that people have. So how you count what the benefits are, how you count what the assets are, uh, you, you look at all your assets and s determine what you want to do with them. You, you mentioned the consolidation of pension funds. Would, is that going to look at consolidating Chicago's pension funds into state pension funds? That's something that the Civic Federation has called for. Right. I think everything needs to be looked at. We have to make sure that we have systems that are uh, creating economies of scale, that, that we don't have disparate systems doing different things. Uh, I think the most logical place to start is the downstate police and fire because there are, you know, 600 of them. They are so small in many cases and they are very underfunded. Um, they're in chronically bad shape. So I think that's the best place to start, but we're going to look at, at everything. The Civic Committee of the Commercial Club recommended raising the income tax 1%. Is that on the table? I do not believe so, no, absolutely not. They've also mentioned taxing retirement income. And by the way, we're not talking about some left-wing tax and spend group. This is a group of business leaders. Right. Taxing retirement income, is that off the table 100%? I, I, I believe that's off the table as well. So, so Dan Hines, uh, Governor Pritzker had talked about uh, a temporary progressive income tax where he'd issue tax credits to lower earners during the campaign. And then he said he, he wasn't so hot on that idea. Is that off the table? Well, first, let me say that, you know, groups that are coming out with ideas, I mean, we welcome ideas. We're glad that the business groups, our own budget committee is, you know, using their talents and their ideas to help solve our problems. But we're not going to agree on everything. And the governor has been very clear. The reason he supports a progressive income tax is not only to solve a budget problem, but to make our tax system fairer. And so to impose a, an income tax increase, whether it's direct or in, indirect right now, would be unfair to middle class taxpayers. So we're not in support of that. Taxing retirement income, we also do not believe is fair. Um, and then lastly, there's, you know, there's ideas out there to uh, look into the sales tax and expanding that. That's a regressive tax. So we really want to stay focused on a graduated income tax. But because it takes two years, we have to solve the problem in 2020 with a bridge budget, including a, a, another array of, a, a different array of revenues. And I didn't hear you say that the state was going to make the full $9 billion payment in the pension system. Is, is a pension obligation bond like something the mayor has talked about at the city level? Is that being considered at the state level? Well, I, I tell you what we're, what we're considering. One is some of the things I've mentioned, consolidation, uh, asset transfers in. Um, pension obligation bonds have been used in the past and, and frankly abused in the past. Uh, but if we can find ways to infuse cash and assets into the pension system, that is not only going to increase our funding level, but reduce the pressure of our annual contribution. But we also want to make sure that we are being honest and, and looking directly at this pension ramp that has really become um, a, a burden on the state of Illinois. All right, Dan Hines, David Harris, will be awaiting that budget address in just about eight days. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Brandis. Glad to be with you. And now, Brandis, back to you. Still to come on Chicago tonight, gynecological mesh causing complications for some, leading to one of the largest product lawsuits in history. How the American slave trade changed when the transatlantic trade was prohibited. Visit a new exhibition at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. And Chicago researchers study mice in space to better understand what happens to an astronaut's body during prolonged spaceflight. But first, the controversial issue of blackface, the darkening of one's skin to appear black, has surged back into the country's cultural conversation. The 1984 medical school yearbook page of Virginia Governor Ralph Northam features a person in blackface posing next to someone dressed in a KKK costume. Northam now says neither person in the photo is him, but he did admit to wearing blackface while impersonating Michael Jackson during a dance contest in the 1980s. In theater and comedy, depictions of blackface took place well into the 20th century and even the year 2000 when late night hosts Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon wore blackface during skits. So joining us to share their perspectives on this touchy and taboo subject are Anthony LeBlanc, Associate Artistic Director of the Second City Improvisational Theater in Chicago, and writer and comedian Aaron Freeman, the artist in residence of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, and former host of Chicago Tomorrow, a science series that aired here on WTTW. Thanks to you both for joining us. 
Thank you. So, first question, I know we're already kind of <laughs> chuckling at the, the concept, but is there ever a time when it's okay to wear a blackface, Anthony? Uh, I would say, um, whew, wow. Uh, so when I was thinking about this, uh, as it's come up in the news, I think about the move like Tropic Thunder, right? Where there is a certain amount of, the way it's done, you're also admonishing the person who's wearing it in a certain way. That does have some leeway, but I still think that today you wouldn't have that same movie happen. I think that as we progress further, we probably have gotten away from the idea of like, do we need this? Is this necessary? Is this something that should exist as a choice that we put into entertainment? Aaron? I think this is a great testament to how much progress has been made in race and racial relations in the U.S. I was born in 1956. In 1956, we were not worried about whether or not white people were putting black stuff on their faces. We were worried about whether or not they would put bullets in our heads. This is such a, uh, an airy-fairy leisure discussion about what some guy did in 1984. So no, I, 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 think, I, I, think, I think it's a great statement of how far things have come, because it is not... Uh, it's, it, it, and you know, we have to ask, is it ever right? In the picture of Dorian Gray, uh, Oscar Wilde says that a book cannot be moral or immoral, it's either well-written or badly written, and that's all. And a joke is either, as you know, the only coin of the realm in our business is, does he get a laugh? And it, whether or not he gets a laugh depends largely on the audience, mm -hmm. but that's all. And I, if, if, if those guys get laughs with their jokes, God bless them. There's a certain amount of like what the reason for the joke is, right? Like, is the joke, and that's why I bring up Track the Thunder as an idea of like, is the joke meant to make some kind of higher point? Is there a satirical reason for doing that? Otherwise, why wouldn't you just have a black person do the thing that's that's happening? Why wouldn't another black performer be the person wow. who performs said joke or impersonation or do said thing? There's only one, easier and only one Larry Olivier. You know, so, when Olivier does Othello, there's only one Olivier. There's only one of him, and I want him to do Othello. There's, could Idris Elba be, be Othello? Like, well, is not that in 1965. A, but, but. Well, you know what, let's, let's do this. So you're both in the comedy world. We've got uh, a soundbite from Billy Crystal as Sammy Davis Jr. in 1986, the HBO special, Don't Get Me Started. It's not like you're bragging or, you know, it's not an ostentatious thing They're with fun. You. They're fun. They're fun, and they are part of me because I can't get the damn things off, you know, but I love them. You know, it's fun. It's, it's a tinkle toy. These Offensive? This Ozzie Davis. Uh, no, not at all. Not even remotely. Not microscopically. To me, yeah. But that's mostly because of, you're looking at the time of, like, it's not... Uh, a point where black people can't do anything, so you have a, a white person having to portray a black person on stage because there are no white people who are, can, who are going to be allowed to perform it, versus like, what's the reason for being Sammy Davis Jr. other than this, I'm getting a bit? There's no higher point or purpose to that joke that's happening. But it was an extremely good performance, didn't you think? That was a really good Sammy Davis impression. Then you can do that in your bedroom with your buddies versus putting it on, I mean, like, the, for me, like when something shows up, like for example, like Jimmy Fallon being Chris Rock, right? There's so many network executives that had to get, that had to go through to be like, that's cool. And then what does that say about those people who are allowing that to happen versus just like, even something that's like, I never expected someone to ever see. Like, like the hidden thing that I never wanted to come out, like it's so a little more. Is there, is there a difference then between impersonation and mockery? I, I think that if you're impersonating someone, I think there isn't at this point in time. I think, I think it, it, impersonating, if, you're, if I'm impersonating a black person and I have to put on blackface to do it, then I, I think that doesn't, why? why? Like what but is the purpose of it? you don't think Olivier was trying to mock Othello? I don't think he's trying to mock Othello. Or, or the other hundreds of I, great I, actors who've I, done I, Othello. I think, I think it more has to do with the fact of Jesus people not seeing black people as Jesus. good enough to perform Othello and find a good enough black actor to do it. There's nobody as good as Olivier was in that's, his day. That's all subjective, right? Well, right. Considering, like, considering you, and I want to, you know what, I want to come back to that because I, the, the history, like, can, can you remind us about the history of blackface and why it's so controversial? Anthony LeBlanc. Yeah, so, you know, you have blackface, which has existed for a very long time as far as, like, us, uh, people using that to represent black characters on stage, right? And, it, and America takes it to a next level, right? Of really being the exporters, of really making it the kind of more the minstrel show ishy, pushing it into the straight blackface as the exaggerating the stereotypes in the mid 19th century and moving into the 20th century. But I think that one of the things that is important to realize is it starts from a place of where black people are now allowed to perform these things. So then white actors are portraying black characters 
And, and that becomes something in which that, where you first get that introduction of it in your 14th, 1400s and 1500s. Well, but we've moved so far away from that and the idea that you have a, a movie full of nothing but black people and you have the occasional white person with like a Black Panther, like, you know, do, is it necessary to then say like, oh, we have to have this black representation inside of this story that we're telling of a Shakespearean play, right? You can well, always cast a black actor to do it. Well, you mean, in, I don't know, you think that in like, 1965 they should have, they could have found somebody, could have found somebody to do 100%. it. 100%. There, there are probably many people who are performing and doing great things that you could have found to then you could perform. could have. And yeah. so you think that there's another Olivier. There was another Olivier right, right, right I, laying I, around I, there and he could have found I think it's more, it's more of a condemnation of the time, of like that the idea that people at that point in time still saw black people as a certain type or a certain less than, so therefore they're not willing to take a chance on or go towards that person. And, but in the, case of, in the case of the 70s and 80s when these pictures were taken yeah. um, and now we're, we are discovering them, is there something that happens in that time frame that obviously it, it was okay then and it's, we're looking back and going, it's not okay now. Who was it that said that the, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there? And it was just a different, and I can assure you, the world I was born into was just a different planet. It was a, it was a different United States. It was a different planet Earth. It's nothing remotely like this world now. You weren't, there was nobody like you on TV in 1956. I can assure you, rest assured. It's just a different world. Yeah, but there's also a certain amount of like knowledge of understanding, right? I say that if you go back to say like, we're in 1860, right? There's a certain amount of understanding of how people saw black people. That's gonna be different than 1980, where I think in 1980, I think you know better, right? You understand what you're doing and the fact that it's probably offensive to wear blackface, where I would say if you're at a time when you see people as a whole, as an entire society differently, there's a little bit more of a pass historically. But I would say in 1980, you know what you're doing. You know what you did. You probably knew that you did it as a joke because you thought it was a joke to be a black person, not that you thought it was funny to do the impersonation of the person that is there. Maybe. I, again, you saw, we talked about Billy Crystal's Louis Armstrong, which was unequivocally a tribute to Louis Armstrong. I mean, there's just, you, you've seen that bit? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that was even microscopically mocking of Louis I, Armstrong? I, w I, I would question the why, and then I would say that even if he didn't mean it as a mockery, I would say that it's more an indictment of the society that made it where it's okay for him to think that it's okay. So a new Pew Research Center poll indicates about one third of Americans think it's quote, always or sometimes acceptable for a white person to use makeup to darken their skin as part of a Halloween costume. Does that surprise you, Anthony? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty insane. And, uh, Aaron Freeman, surprising? Um, I, I have very low expectations of white people. <laughs> I don't expect, I mean, I, I have low expectations of humans. We're a bunch of apes. And people will do things, to, they will try to make their jokes, and they'll try to make jokes in whatever way they can. And I, I as a comedian, I mm -hmm. think that I grant comedians broad leeway. And particularly, I would say that there should definitely be a statute of limitations on a joke. You know, and that, that you can't, it's not fair, because any comedian is performing for the audience of his day. Mm -hmm. And that's just, we, we are, all performers are vulnerable, we're doing the best we can, it's a very tough business, and you try to do whatever you can do, and you're supposed to do that. The best comedians are, they take risks. Mm -hmm. The best ones, yeah. that's what they do. The thing that surprised me about that stat is that people actually admitted it, right? That's kind of surprising to me. I, I do think people do believe it, and, and I, I, there's more things inherently that are racist or handling racist tones, but I think that's why we see that nowadays. Yeah. Conversation I'm sure we'll keep having. Aaron Freeman and Anthony LeBlanc thank, LeBlanc, thank you both for joining us. And up next, one of the largest product lawsuits in history. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. There's a shortage of African Americans in STEM because there aren't enough opportunities. ComEd wants to change that. One program at a time, celebrating Black History Month with Solar Spotlight. Building confidence, building bright minds, building the workforce of the future. 
It's one of the largest product lawsuits in history, bigger than the class action suits over asbestos, but it's something people aren't really talking about. More than 100,000 suits have been filed against the makers of vaginal mesh, and verdicts have reached into the multi-millions of dollars. But some doctors stand behind the product, saying it helps women who need it to repair weakened pelvic tissue, urinary incontinence, and prolapse. Here to talk about the controversial product and her reporting is journalist Susan Berger, whose story about the issue appears in the Washington Post. Susan, thank you for joining us. Sure. So first of all, tell us what is vaginal mesh? What's it made of? Um, it, well, it's, it's made of, it's a plastic, it's polypropylene, which, um, and it, it's, it's, some people will say that it's something that shouldn't be embedded in the human body because part of the problems are, it, as doctors will tell you, it gets hard over time, it can, it doesn't for everyone, but there have been problems, but it's plastic basically. Um, how's it used? Why are women having surgery? Well, um, women, it, this is a very common problem. It's not talked about a lot because it's embarrassing, um, but women after childbirth, after having lots of kids, or as they get older and menopause, um, they leak urine when they laugh, when they sneeze, when they cough, and they go to their doctors and say, what can I do? And so mesh was um, introduced, I think, in about 1998, and it was thought to be this really quick fix, easy to do. The surgeons, it wasn't, it wasn't a long surgery, and um, a lot of women thought this is the, this is the fix. It's going to lift the bladder so that um, you don't have that problem. And we're looking at a, a graphic right now of the mesh, uh, kind of where it's where it can be inserted into the body. But so you've interviewed a lot of women who have had problems. Explain what I has gone wrong for them. Well, and, and you know, you see it on paper. It's a lot different than talking to these women. And a lot of them are young, and they're it's it's they're very distraught. I mean, they have been to doctor after doctor, and they don't know why this is happening. This is supposed to fix me, and yet they're left with pain and um, fevers and just debilitating blood in their urine, painful urination. Um, they, they can't have sex with their husbands anymore. Um, it's, it's been devastating for the women who do have problems. And the women who do have problems is about 5%. It's, um, there are th it's reported that three to four million worldwide women have had mesh implanted. So if it's about 5%, that's almost 200,000 women with problems. And many of those women with problems need surgery to correct it. And it's not easy to correct. What does the FDA say about all this? Well, the FP FDA, that's another whole story. They, um, in 2000, in, I, I believe it was 2010, 8 to 10, they got 2,800 complaints. And they, what they did is they reclassified mesh as a medical device. It went from being class 2 which is risky to class three, which is a higher risk. And the timing is crazy because today the FDA held hearings to, to further look into this. But um, the FDA did put out a warning, but it, it didn't take it off the market. I mean, it's, um, it, yeah, so yeah, they the just market. changed, they, they changed the, those the, hearings today. Um, actually, the one thing I, and I listened to part of it, I got, I had a link, I got to listen to some of it. And um, they, the one takeaway that I saw was that, that there are, that the serious side effects are not rare. I mean, they all pretty much hands down said that. Now, some doctors are disputing the findings and, and some of the complaints that they're hearing from women. What did you, what did you find out? Um, there are doctors, and, and there, are, there are doctors, and there are women who do fine with mesh. They have this, and it, it fixes their problem, and it, it works out really well. Um, but some of the doctors that I talked to think, said that they would never, the two doctors in my story, Dr. Margolis, who was an expert witness, and he, I think, has removed about 600 cases of mesh, and Dr. Uh, Shlomo Raz, he's out in LA, and he's, he's removed even more. Both of those, they, they would not put mesh in. They take mesh out. And taking mesh out, they said, is like t trying to take bubble gum out of hair. Why is it so difficult? It, Why is that? It's, that's just the nature, because the mesh changes in the body, and it adheres to, it can adhere to the urethra. It's just hard. And one doctor said it's like taking, trying to take rebar out of concrete, like almost impossible. Um, it's, so it's one of the largest lawsuits in history. One settlement in 2015 was for $457 million. That's just one settlement. How much more are manufacturers settling for? Um, well, there are more lawsuits. There, I, I don't think the, I think the class actions are pretty much done, but there's a lot of individual suits still going on. Um, 
in fact, after my story was published at the end of January, there was another settlement that just was uh, released for $41 million verdict to eight, one woman for, um, it was against Johnson & Johnson. So and, and what are they claiming in their suit? That they're claiming that, that actually, the, if you read the lawsuits, I mean, that they're destroying people's lives. I mean, that they should have been warned that this is material that should never have been placed in the body. Now, that's debatable. and. Even some of the companies that have done the settlements are appealing, you know, the rulings. Um, and the, uh, from what I've read, the, the plastic can harden. It can. Um, and women and sometimes their husbands can notice that or, or even the doctors well, notice it. Well, that's one of the, one of the most, the most interesting, well, in, not interesting, but terrible <laughs> um, problems was one of the women said to me that, you know, she wasn't feeling well and then her husband during sex was like injured. He was scratched and she went to her gynecologist and she lived in a small town and he didn't really think there was a problem. His, the glove that he used on the exam was torn. That's how sharp the mesh is protruding, you and know, through the vaginal wall. And so it's, it's been banned in some countries? It's been banned, it's, yes. Um, now it's, I think it's, it's the UK, Scotland, um, Australia, and Ireland have all banned They've banned mesh, and actually, the UK and Australia have issued a public apology about it. Is there a way to, uh, for a non-surgical way to help with incontinence or prolapse? There is. There is. Um, the doctors said that you, there are, there are, the least that you, the easiest thing you can do are exercises and pessaries, which are like rings that you put in, that you insert. Um, there are also slings that doctors like that are made from organic materials or from your like tendons in your own body. So that's, an, uh, that's another way to go. And then there's something called a birch procedure. And um, the bladder's like suspended from nearby ligaments. But Dr. Margolis told me sometimes that can fail too. Are there any other surgeries? Like if, or if you do want surgeries, what precautions should someone take? Can, can tissue from your own body be used instead of mesh? Yeah, but that's what they're when they say organic. The birch? Yes, Sorry. yeah, and not the birch, but just using organic or biologic material to, instead of a mesh. Are there any precautions that can be taken? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's something that just that can happen. Um, it, it's a problem. And some, some of those doctors who dispute the safety concerns say it's just a matter of a doctor being correctly trained. Is that right? Well, yeah. The doctors who really, I mean, many doctors told me that you need a good doctor who does many of these, and, and it, it'll go fine. Other doctors don't agree with that. Now, the. Um, the Society of Urogynecologists on OGS on their website, they have a position statement that says how safe it is. And it was written in 2014. They've not changed the statement at all. Um, I was told by, by Dr. Margolis to look into the background of some of the doctors who signed the, the statement. And when I did, we found that some of those doctors had financial interest in MeSH. So, you know, it's all, right. it's all about the money. Yeah, we'll have to leave it there. Susan Berger, journalist, thank, thank you so you. much for joining us. Thank you. And rare objects from a New Orleans historical group are now on display in Skokie. They are on loan to the Illinois Holocaust Museum, which just opened its first exhibition on slavery. Chicago Tonight visited for an early look. America was booming in the early 1800s, but at great cost to humanity. The United States Congress officially ended the transatlantic slave trade in 1808, but hereditary bondage endured and the domestic slave trade thrived. This chapter of U.S. history is explored in a new show called Purchased Lives. Our tagline for the museum is take history to heart, take a stand for humanity. And this exhibition enables us to look at a really important, critical period of American history. Purchased Lives examines the U.S. slave trade between 1808 and 1865. So after the abolition of the international slave trade, but while it was very much happening here in the U.S. Enslaved people were moved around the country when tobacco demand fell and cotton production increased. Their forced migration led to a new term, slave driver. Another term that was popular was being sold down the river, again from the Upper South to the Lower South. Um, people were forcibly moved by foot, on trains, by ship, down to the Deep South. And Louisiana became that hub because of the Mississippi, because of the waterways. And Louisiana and New Orleans already had 
banking and trade that was happening in the city. So, of course, slave trade became centered there, too. Beyond bankers and merchants, insurance companies profited and hospitals, which helped restore a person's health before they were sold, and notaries, even men's clothiers Brooks Brothers. What is interesting about the Brooks Brothers coat is that the cotton was raised by slaves, in, by enslaved people in the South. It was then sent north to places like um, Massachusetts. The finest cotton would have been sent to England and France to be prepared into clothing, but lower level cotton was sent to the north of America, processed there into clothing, and then sent back to the Deep South. In this case, the object that is on display is a jacket that would have been worn by an enslaved person who was an in-house servant. The exhibition is filled with small details that tell a larger story of devastation. There are manifests, ship manifests, that list uh, human cargo that is being sent down to New Orleans. There are uh, records of sale. One of the most important objects that's in the exhibition is a slave collar that was worn, that would be forcibly put on a slave who had run away, was recaptured, and this was punishment. It's um, about six pounds, and there are two bells that um, are connected to it, so you would hear if that enslaved person was trying to escape again. Most commonly, people would attempt to run away and get freedom when they knew that there was an impending sale that would break apart a family or um, their family had already been broken apart and they were trying to find out where their family members had gone. The exhibition ends on a poignant note. After emancipation, African Americans across the country would take out ads in local papers to search for lost loved ones. The exhibition is called Purchased Lives, the American Slave Trade from 1808 to 1865. It's at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center until August 25th, and there's more to see on our website. Now, Paris, back to you. Brandis, NASA is currently aiming to send humans to Mars within the next two decades, but setting astronauts on extended space missions is fraught with risk. We don't yet know what the impact of long-term exposure to zero gravity and solar radiation will be on the human body. So, a team of Chicago researchers working with NASA sent a team of mini astronauts up into space to study those risks. More specifically, those astronauts are actually mice. And joining us now to tell us about that research is Professor Martha Hotz Vita Terna, whose research at Northwestern University focuses on mouse behavioral genetics, circadian rhythms, and sleep. Vita Terna is part of a team of Chicago researchers working with NASA to better understand the long term impact of space travel on the bodies of mice and human astronauts. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Okay, you. first most basic question why send mice up to space? Well, there's a lot of questions about what the impact of space flight and long duration uh, exposure to the space environment will be on a mammalian system. And mice are a very good uh, system to understand some really basic biological questions that relate directly back to humans. One of the advantages of working with mice is that they actually respond very quickly to being put in the space environment. And so we can study these changes in a much more rapid and controlled manner. And what do we know about being in space for a long period of time and the effects on a body, be it mice or human? Well, one of the most obvious changes is there's loss of bone density, uh, loss of muscle, uh, because there's no resistance exercise, no, no weight bearing, um, walking around. Um, but then there are other changes that happen more long term, such as changes in immune function. I should mention we're looking here at the astronaut Scott Kelly, yeah. um, who you have actually studied. You did a human version of this study. <laughs> Scott Kelly was up in space for a year. His twin brother, Mark Kelly, was down on Earth. Uh, what can you tell us about that study? Well, we're uh, wrapping up our analysis of those um, two individuals, uh, along with uh, nine other research teams. There's 10 teams altogether that have been studying the Kelly twins. Um, our aspect of the uh, changes associated with spaceflight was to study the gut microbiome, the bacteria in the gut.
Okay, so you're studying the, the bacteria in the gut. What does that tell you about space's impact on the body? What, what are you learning from the microbiome? Well, we are definitely seeing changes in the gut bacteria associated with being in space. Uh, we've had the opportunity to study some fecal samples, actually, from mice that flew on a previous experiment and we are seeing very uh, distinct changes associated with space flight. We don't know f what the full significance of those changes is, um, but we're hoping that by looking at that in context of with other physiological changes, we'll start to be able to piece things together. And, and the connection here is when someone goes to space for a while, there's a big disruption in their sleep and their circadian rhythm. So what is the connection between what you've discovered here with, with bacteria and sleep? Well, we did an experiment here on Earth uh, some time ago with uh, our collaborators at other universities in Chicago, um, looking at the effects of sleep disruption or circadian rhythm disruption, disruption in the timing um, on the gut bacteria in mice. And we found that that produced very profound changes in the gut bacteria. So does so, that have implications for people here on Earth that are going through uh, time changes and, and have disruptions in their own circadian rhythms? Yeah, I think so. I think it, it's suggesting that the changes in the gut bacteria may be contributing to what people experience with jet lag and uh, while they're doing shift work, for example. And uh, um, so, so tell us about, um, uh, in space, there's, there's 15 sunrises and sunsets that someone goes through, uh, what effect does that have on the body well, in one day? 16 actually. 16? 16. 16, yeah. Um, I don't know, but I can tell you that in the space station they do have a 24-hour day-night cycle mm -hmm. that the astronauts are exposed to. So. I don't know that the sunrises and sunsets themselves are the issue, but there is still something about being in microgravity that is disrupting circadian rhythms and back, making sleep difficult. Back to the mice, you were telling me you actually put the mice on the rocket launcher. What was that experience like? Well, I launched, I, I transferred the mice into the transport module. So they have a specialized reinforced uh, habitat that they put the animals in for when they launch them to the space station. And um, I had the um, honor, I think is the right word, of putting the mice into the transporter and very carefully transferred the mice one at a time from their cage into the transport cage. Um, and I was so focused on doing a good careful job, I wasn't really thinking about the significance of what I was doing at the moment, but as soon as I was done, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. The magnitude of what I was involved in, and I was sending these mice into space, and I, I had to go in a corner somewhere and cry for a while because I was just so emotionally overwhelmed by that experience. They had no idea what they were getting themselves into. So what, no. so what are the implications then of this study and the future of human space travel? Well, I think as we understand more and more what uh, these microorganisms that we are so dependent on for our health and well-being um, are doing in response to space travel. It'll help us understand how we can um, help support astronaut health for long duration missions. Maybe we need to come up with some specially designed prebiotics or probiotics that would help. Um, at so this point, we don't know what the impact truly is, so it's hard to know what you would anticipate needing to do. So if, if, if someone is going to travel to Mars, they're going to need to sort of know what comes out of this study. Maybe. Yeah. All right, Martha Vita Turner, thank you so much for sharing your well, research with us. Thank you very much. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund.
And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing and join us tomorrow night live at 7. Hear from three candidates running for City of Chicago Treasurer. And it's a complicated choreography to create a brand new ballet from Prelude to Encore. The Joffrey does it for Anna Karenina. And we're now just two days away from the first of our Chicago Tonight mayoral candidate forums. Be sure to join us Thursday and again next Monday and Tuesday to hear from the candidates. Next week's programs can also be heard live on the radio on WBEZ 91.5 FM. And they can all be seen online at WTTW.com as well as Facebook and YouTube. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, an accredited legal education provider and proud sponsor of the continuing legal education program for lawyers held at DePaul University College of Law on February 21st.